So I want to pull this story up because I think, you know, this is something that is important. Uh, that the Democrats are basically bailing on the fight for a minimum wage. Uh, Joe Biden is is not pushing for, um, you know, and the and the raise raise the minimum wage act was looking to increase the minimum wage of non federal employees by what twenty twenty five or something along those lines, right? Twenty twenty five is when the minimum wage was going to go up to fifteen dollars an hour, which fifteen dollars an hour would have been okay for like twenty twelve or 2013 somewhere in that range and that's what people were calling for because that would have been the appropriate raise minimum wage rate increase based on cost of living based on how uh inflation was working based on how the costs of everything were going up so they basically said well we'll listen to the fight for 15 and we'll raise the minimum wage up to 15 dollars an hour but we'll do it incrementally and by 2025 it'll be up to you know uh It'll be up to fifteen dollars an hour, which basically means that they're keeping, uh, keeping people under the poverty line, regardless, right? Like th this is this is like, this is why people say incrementalism doesn't work because if they would have incrementally started doing this in two thousand nine, we would probably be at fifteen, maybe even twenty dollars an hour for minimum wage, uh, by this time. But we're not, uh, we're not even close to that sort of shit. Now Biden's basically stopped pushing for the Raise the Minimum Wage Act to be a part of the COVID relief fund. Uh, initially, I think it was going to be part of the COVID relief fund, and there was a little bit of controversy about whether it was or wasn't going to be part of it. And now, uh, and now we know that it's not going to be a part of the COVID relief fund. And well, who they're putting the blame on isn't themselves, right? They're not putting the blame on the lack of political will to increase the minimum wage, which they could have done several different times, right? And especially now, this was the argument that we got. This was the argument that all of the liberals were saying, right? All of the all the corporate Democrats were saying is, oh man, this is, now we can finally see some progress. Now we can start pushing on things that really matter, like increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour. This was something that they were all saying. And Democrats have the House, they have the Senate, uh, you know, they have a majority in Congress. They can push back against the Republican if, the, if it lands in a tie because we have, you know, Republicans posing as Democrats, just Joe Biden and Joe Manchin. Um, a lot of Joes seem to be uh, – uh, d Democrats in 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 uh, republic or, or or rather Republicans in Democrats clothing, but if they if they push back, we have Kamala Harris and she's a Democrat and she'll side with the Democrats, uh, and we're not seeing any of that right. Who they're putting the blame on right now is uh, the Senate parliamentarian, the Senate parliamentarian. This is something I didn't even know existed in in the American political. Uh, sphere. But basically, this is a person that was appointed by the Democrats in 2012 as somebody that can uh, keep an eye on what should and shouldn't go into certain bills, right? Like, like they do these omnibus bills where it's like, okay, uh, we want a bill to prevent uh, Comcast and Verizon from you know, raising the raising the price of the internet for people like throttling speeds, and we want to keep a law that up. Okay, and they're like, okay, that's fine, but we want to include a bill that's also increasing the military budget by five hundred billion dollars. Uh, so if you want to keep net neutrality in place, you got to increase the funding for the military, stuff like that. So her job would basically be to say, okay, this bill you're attaching really doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. Uh, so maybe we don't attach this bill. Stuff like that. That's that's what it seems like this person is. And and it's not an elected official. It's an appointed position. And this position was appointed in 2012 under the Democratic control. So this person is supposed to, uh, you know, probably go along with whatever the Democratic narrative is. And if right now the Democratic narrative is that we need to increase the minimum wage by uh, up to $15 an hour, even if it's by 2025, why is this person opposing that in the COVID relief bill? The reason why... Uh, What's her name? Elizabeth McDonough is is blocking this is because she says that uh, this is a budget reconciliation. That's that's what she calls it. She calls it a budget reconciliation and increasing the minimum wage is not part of that. It's not part of the uh, budget reconciliation. And the way I look at it is basically her saying, well, the workers are not included in the covid relief bill. We're not really trying to help the workers here. 
right? They're not part of the budget reconciliation. They're not, they're not up in the negotiating table when it comes to getting people relief for COVID, right? Uh, and, and so because they're not going to be a part of the COVID relief bill, they're not going to be negotiated for. Now, again, Kamala Harris being the vice president and being someone that can break ties and, and kind of veto decisions like this by the Senate parliamentarian, she can come in and basically say, no, you're wrong. We want this to go in. We want the budget. We want budget reconciliation to include workers, to include people who are struggling right now. We should put something in place that helps workers, increases their wage, and gives them hazard pay for being essential, right? If we're going to claim that these people are essential workers, we're going to claim that they're heroes, then we should treat them as such. Uh, and she hasn't, and she won't. She won't come out and saying any of this stuff, right? Now, even people like Bernie Sanders are kind of pulling back on the fight. And this was some. This was another flagship issue of his. And one of his flagship issues was that uh, that you know people should get a living wage. They should have fifteen dollars an hour, which would still kind of be, uh, like I said, uh, which still wouldn't be enough. Which still wouldn't be enough, but. Now what he's saying that now that the Senate parliamentarian is not going to include this in the COVID relief bill, which I think it should be a part of the COVID relief bill, and it shouldn't be a incremental increase. It should be an immediate thing that goes into effect in the bill that $15 should be the minimum wage right now, even though that's still on the low end of minimum wages. Um, he's saying, well, we'll find a different way to allocate funds f to increase the minimum wage, like, uh, like oh, taxes on the rich or we'll find some tax incentives uh for the rich so that they will you know be along be, like agree to increasing the minimum wage so again it's not going to go up until 2025 the claim is that it's not going to go up uh until 2025 which means that it's still going to keep people working for working at a minimum wage under the poverty line because in five years, you know the inflation is going to go up, and fifteen dollars an hour is not going to be enough, and seven twenty-five an hour is going to be even worse, and it's going to create this catastrophic poverty problem, where a lot more people are going to need government assistance, a lot more people are going to go on welfare uh, and social security, and and have to get uh, food stamps and things of that sort. And you know, look at the way the government had to deal with um, unemployment during the pandemic where people that were eligible to get unemployment uh and and look i was not one of them i fell through every single crack of every single thing um even the people that were eligible for it it took them months to get to it took them months to get uh their their relief checks their weekly payments of what was it 600 bucks something along those lines so they are Essentially saying, well, if we raise it to $15 or if we start raising the minimum wage to a certain point, we won't have to worry about this sort of stuff. And the government can just kind of function the way that it needs to function without having this overwhelming uh, pressure on the uh, on unemployment insurance and things of that sort. So they want to get people off the welfare system so they'll incrementally increase the minimum wage, but still keep them right at that poverty line threshold. That's why it's an incremental increase to 2025. It's not to do it out of the, the kindness of their hearts or anything. It's because by 2025, it'll become a moot point and $15 an hour won't really be a livable wage. But then they can go out and say like, oh, look, look, we, we, we listen to activists. We listen to you guys. That's really why they're doing this. Now, th this could have happened, right? There could have been proof that increasing the minimum wage is a good thing. And Obama had that power. Obama was going to increase the minimum wage to like ten or eleven dollars for federal employees back in 2012, I think. I might have the dates of that wrong, but under his administration, he wanted to um, increase federal minimum wage, uh, and then you know use it as a barometer to. Uh, you know, increase the minimum wage of everybody else. Well, you didn't do that. And he could have done that through an executive order, by the way. He could have increased federal minimum wage uh, using an executive order, just like Biden could have done that. Biden could have increased the minimum wage to $15 an hour for all federal employees and used it as a barometer um, to say, okay, this is something that works and we can do it. So Obama had an opportunity to, and Biden had an opportunity to, 
And they just didn't. They didn't because they lacked the political will. And they're in the pockets of the bankers. They're in the pockets of corporations. And that's not beneficial to people like Jeff Bezos and the Waltons and, you know, the, the, the CEO of Target and all these other people. It's not beneficial for them. Why would it be? Because if they increase the minimum wage, that means that whatever profits they're making doesn't go directly to the top. That all gets stopped. They would have to take a pay cut. And, oh, boy, uh, instead of making, you know, two billion dollars a year, maybe they only make one billion dollars. Oh, my goodness. What a cut for them. Oh, they were going to have to make so many sacrifices, like not eating caviar and wasting all their fucking food and not living in a giant ma mansion for themselves and not having a helicopter or a private jet or a fucking super yacht. Their employees are actually going to be able to feed themselves and pay rent and pay their bills without having to worry about whether if I pay this bill, I'm not going to be able to put food on my kid's table. Oh, the pain of it all for these people. Right now, what, what certain economists say is if they had kept the same trends of increasing minimum wage since 1968, we would be at $24 an hour. Um, other economists say that it would be a lot higher than that because we haven't really kept up with the, with the uh, trends of increased cost of living. And for the last 12 to 15 years, wages have been stagnant. <clears throat> There's not been an increase at $7.25 an hour. Now, certain states, though, and I covered this a couple weeks ago, certain states have increased their own minimum wage, but the federal minimum wage still remains at 725. And a lot of states actually do um, keep that, right? Most states have kept their minimum wage at the federal minimum wage. Uh, I believe Pennsylvania is one of them. The state that I live in is one of them. You know, certain states have gone up to like D.C. is 15. If you work in Washington, D.C., you're going to get at least $15 an hour. But you have to. But you have to do that because D.C. is so expensive to live in. I mean, Pennsylvania is, is if you work uh, full time on a minimum wage, it's twelve thousand dollars a year after taxes and such. Right. You can't really live on that, even in a state like Pennsylvania, where a lot of cities are hyper affordable to live in. They're not the same cost as New York or Chicago or L.A. or Seattle or San Francisco or Washington, D.C. or anywhere in Florida. Like it's not that it's not hyper exp expensive to live in these cities, but it's still not affordable based on what the minimum wage is and what companies are paying people here. Minimum wage during the Great Depression went up. But that was because labor, th there was a, a major labor movement and they fought for it. There were general strikes all across the country in 1934. There were general strikes leading up to the Great Depression. There were general strikes after that. And once the Wagner Act was signed, it was basically a, a, a you know, the, the doors were open for workers to start being able to sit at the negotiating table. Unions were given a little bit more power, right? They were able to advocate for the uh, for the worker. And they signed a, uh, an increase of minimum wage in 1938. That became a thing. Fair Minimum Wage Act. That became a thing. Uh, but that's because that wasn't because FDR was like, boy, these workers sure aren't being treated properly. He could give a shit less. I mean, the dude was, you know, related to bankers. Um, and and I, you know, but he but he also advocated to say that if you really want something done, you you got to push the government through direct action to do it. And that's what happened. People pushed them through direct action. And they got shit done. Now, the major myth that happens with the increase of minimum wage is, well, the prices of everything are going to go up. First of all, the prices of everything have already gone up. They go up all the time. The cost of milk keeps going up. The cost of gas keeps going up. The cost of groceries, the cost of bills, the cost of other products, they all keep going up. And they have been for the last 12 to 15 years that the minimum wage has been stagnant. So there you go. Just in that one statement, your myth has been busted. The prices always are going to keep going up. It doesn't mean that workers have to suffer because of it. Because the prices going up aren't, it's not benefiting the workers. It's not like Target's raising the price of some of their groceries and some of their products. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh man, Target employees are getting paid 2 or $3 an hour more. 
because of the price of things going up. No, it's because the fucking investors, the board of trustees, and the CEOs, and everybody on that fucking, you know, everybody that has a C something in front of their name, they're all making a shit ton more money. That's all that means. What we need to do, and, and really, if you're worried about, like, the price of, oh, McDonald burgers are going to be $8 now. No, 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 they're not, because their CEO makes 400 times that of a minimum wage employee. Guess where we can reallocate funds to keep your shitty burger at a dollar? The CEO is making 400 times that. Even if he made 100 times that, your burger would still be uh, kept at a dollar, and everybody at McDonald's could be paid a fucking living wage. Right, they could be paid fifteen dollars an hour right fucking now, and it would improve uh, uh, worker morale. People would take their jobs a little bit more seriously because they feel more valued, they feel more appreciated on a monetary end. And all of this has been proven, by the way. All of this has been proven, time and time again. And these aren't just these aren't just conservative arguments anymore. These are also liberal arguments. I've seen liberals come out and say, "Well, we can't increase the minimum wage because the price of everything will start going up." So now liberals are starting to make conservative arguments because that's what the Democrats are doing. You know, there are certain Democrats that are making the same arguments as Republicans are when it comes to minimum wage. What during we should also put a salary cap on CEOs, right? There should be a rule that a CEO can't make more than 10 times the amount of the lowest paying employee. This is very similar to how worker co-ops operate. A lot of worker co-ops will have a cap in saying, okay, if you're if you're part of the upper management, if you're part of the C, your CEO, CFO, CTO, whatever, you don't make X amount of dollars more than the lowest paid employee. So if the lowest paid employee is only getting 10 bucks an hour, then the CEO can't get more than 100 bucks an hour. And if he is, that person is corrupt and they would be voted out of being the CEO and somebody else would be put in charge in their place. There needs to be major corporate restructuring happening in this country. And the minimum wage battle is kind of showing us that. Not just that, but we should tax them, right? I mean, this has been a long, drawn-out battle of tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich. We've been saying that for decades now. In, in the 50s, when Eisenhower was president, corporations and the rich were taxed at 90%. And guess what? The country didn't fucking fall apart. Guess what he did? He expanded the highway programs. He was able to actually help and benefit people. Now, sure, there's lots of problems with Eisenhower as well, but he got some shit right. And the country didn't fall apart. We didn't die off as a country. In fact, that is what most people count as the great again, right? When, but going back to the 40s and 50s, the way things were after World War II, that's what people call great again. That's what they go back to. But that was because the working class of this country was actually able to make a livable wage. You could actually have one person in the family have a full-time job and take care of the bills, take care of putting food on the table, pay off their cars, pay the gas, pay the, you know, whatever. And it was fine. And you still had some left over. So if there was an emergency, you weren't financially destitute for the rest of your life. You could come out of debt very quickly. But that's because corporations were being taxed more. It was, you know... People were taken care of. Workers were being treated properly, and this was and and really that was that was uh, on the tail end of things too. Because in forty seven, uh, unions lost a lot of power thanks to the Taft Hartley Act. Now, here's here's the thing with this argument: is that is the Democrats have basically proved themselves to be um, just as bad as the GOP at this point. Right. I mean, there's a billion and one examples of how the Democrats are equally, if not worse than the GOP in a lot of cases. But they're but they're no better than them. Right. There's no covid relief. There's no stimulus checks. None of that shit got sent out. None of that shit has been agreed on. And what do they promise us? Joe Biden said, if Georgia turns blue, you'll have two thousand dollars, uh, two thousand dollar checks immediately. That's the first thing that they were going to do. That's the first thing that they were going to vote on on day one. But what did he do on day one? Joe Biden sent ground troops into Syria and now he's he's bombed them over some bullshit as per usual. Before there was any aid at home. 
people are about to be homeless. People are about to lose their homes. They don't have enough money. And and they're, and they're fucking bombing another country that they have no business being in over false pretenses yet again. What else is this is another thing that they're doing, right? Uh, what did the GOP do last year? The GOP kept saying, oh, well, we should just open the economy. We should we should have people shopping again. We should have people going to restaurants and bars again. We should get these people back to work. That was the GOP call. And all the Democrats were like, no, 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 no. We have to stay at home. We have to do this. We have to do that. But provided zero financial relief for any of the American citizens. Right. Uh, and now what's what is Joe Biden doing? Joe Biden is pushing back and saying that we need to reopen schools so parents can get back to work. Reopen schools so parents can get back to work, and the science is, is saying otherwise. And Joe Biden made a big stink of being a leader that's going to lead by science. Oh, I'm going to lead by science, he says. I'm going to lead by science. I'm going to lead by science. No, you're not. You're trying to you're trying to pit people pit public health against the economy again. That's what you're doing. You're not leading by science. The science is telling you that what you're doing is wrong. So why are you not listening to science if that's what you're going to lead by? People need economic relief. You made up $6 trillion and gave it to the fucking banks and the Wall Street. You know what? You know what? It has been helping people, each other, and mutual aids. That's it. It hasn't been the government. The government sent you $1,800 in a year. They expect the American populace to live off of $1,800 in a year. That's way below the poverty line. This is something that the Democrats do that the Republicans don't, which is they use black, brown, and the LGBTQ plus community uh, as rainbow smoke screens to put forward their pro-corporate and pro-imperialist actions for the sake of personal profits. Raytheon stocks went up after he bombed Syria. Guess who the guess who the uh, Secretary of Defense is? Guess who's in charge of the DOD and the Pentagon? Someone that's currently still sitting on the board at Raytheon. Lloyd Austin. Still sitting on board at Raytheon. Remind me about how... Uh, Everybody chastised Trump for doing shit like this, but is staying incredibly silent at Joe Biden doing the exact same shit as Trump. Now we're going to ignore all of the political corruption that comes out of the Biden administration. Now we're going to ignore the illegal wars that Joe Biden is going to start. Now we're going to ignore the fact that Joe Biden is using economic wars on countries that don't deserve it during a pandemic. We're the only country right now that's engaging in a firefight. We're the only country right now that's engaging in a war while our citizens are suffering and struggling to get by. Remind me again how we're the greatest country on the planet. What is the justification for that? There's a fucking global pandemic going on right now. You can't get vaccines into the arms of people quick enough. Science is telling you not to reopen your country. You have no economic relief coming for your citizens. But yeah, you're going to blow up black and brown people across the world. That's that's fine. Shows us where the priorities lie. In 2008 and 2009, uh, Obama sent money to the already wealthy to help them out. After after the housing markets collapsed, after the auto industry was suffering, he restructured the auto industry to help the CEOs. He didn't restructure the auto industry to help the working class. Why would he? He doesn't give a shit about them. What the Democrats have done is use the minimum wage argument to get votes. And by the way, this was something that AOC and the squad and all of the progressives, Pramila Jayapal, Ro Khanna, were saying was something that we can win if we get Democrats into the House and the Senate, if they get a majority in the House and the Senate. $15 minimum wage, no fucking problem. We'll get that shit done. We got that shit for you. It's a fucking okay. Let's fight for that instead of getting people health care because we know we won't have enough votes in the House of Representatives, even though that was the fucking point of the force to vote movement. 
And they said this was something that's doable. This was a progressive fight that we can win right now. And fucking nothing. Fucking nothing. They bailed on it. Raise the minimum wage rack wants to increase the minimum wage by 2025, and even that isn't happening. They're a useless party at this point. Hey, the GOP isn't any better, but that goes without saying. If you're on the left, then yeah, the GOP was never your party. If you're uh if if you're a socialist, it was never your party. If you are a black, brown, LGBTQ plus person, it was never your party. If you aren't an evangelical Christian that believes that the police need to be overfunded and patrolling the streets nonstop because every single human person is com- going to commit a crime somewhere and needs to be locked up in a in a in a a, a, a four foot by four foot jail cell for the rest of their life because there's no redemption even though your fucking religion tells you that there should be redemption for people and that you should give people a second chance and help them out and it, that the GOP is not a party for you. The GOP is a party for hyper uh, hyper religious pro-corporate, callous individuals. You know the people that taint what religion is actually supposed to be about? That's who the GOP is for. The Democrats are basically people, uh, for for people that I want to ignore that there are problems and put a rainbow pin on their uh, on their shirts and advocate for fucking pride parades and advertising, as long as advertising says they like black and brown and gay people. Meanwhile, we'll go bomb whoever the fuck they want. And they'll skirt around and, and make excuses for it. The, the, the Democrats have become a party of complacency and being blind to what, the, what this country's imperialism actually fucking does. There is no point to having these two parties if you believe that people need to be taken care of. If you believe that empathy and logic and compassion are the core tenets of what we should be leading this country by, then neither of these fucking parties are for you, and I don't understand why people are still supporting these parties. I don't understand why people make excuses for AOC and Bernie Sanders and all of these. I just don't get it. It's always going to be something that I'm going to have a problem with. Because they don't give a shit about you, and they will bail on every fight. They'll bail on every fight that they claim that they'll they'll champion. So, uh, let's look at uh, some comments. Aiden, good to see you, Aiden. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, there's still a Christian nationalist and white supremacist working at the State Department, Fritz Berrigan. I did not know this, and he's in charge of immigration visa for folks uh, from Afghanistan. Get the fuck out of here. Thank you for uh, sharing that link. Uh, I will look into this, and maybe that'll be a topic of uh, discussion for Tuesday or Wednesday's live stream. Uh, so keep a lookout for that. Thank you, Aiden. I appreciate that. I will definitely be saving that link because uh, there is another story about extremism and white supremacy um, that, and how like federal agencies don't know what to do with it that I want to talk about as well. So uh, I'm going to pop over to Rockfin to take a look at some comments there. Uh, Sarah says useful idiots slash paid oppositions that utilize uh, to excuse their criminal negligence. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what ends up that it's kind of what ends up being like on all levels now. Right. The the excuses I'm hearing for the Democratic Party uh, are, are, oh, well, they're being stopped and, and there's opposition and there's this and that to consider. No, it's all lack of political will. That's really all it boils down to. They can make this shit happen. It's just that they don't fucking want to. WM, thanks for tuning into to the Rockfin there. Uh, WM says he sent ground troops into Syria, signed executive o- uh, orders for oil drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and took a backseat on impeachment that wasted time in Congress. But he's, quote, better than Trump, apparently. He's going to lead them uh, by being brain dead. There's a surge coming, man, because the, uh, because the variants uh, be ready for more lockdowns. Uh, I agree. Um uh, I, I 100% agree. I think this is this is sort of the time to be a little bit more safe. Not a lot of people are getting their vaccines. Um, and, you know, I know I've mentioned this. I take care of this 85-year-old woman that has dementia in the evenings part-time. Uh, and we're having a hell of a time getting her signed up for her second dose of the vaccine. You know, and instead of taking care of these things, he's sending ground troops into Syria, approving approving fucking uh, dr- drilling contracts. 
And by taking, you know, this back seat that he's taking to the impeachment, he already made he already made that statement before he got uh, inaugurated. They asked him in December if he was willing to follow through on any sort of impeachment proceedings. And he said that he would not pursue it because it's not um, it, it wouldn't be the best use of time for the American people. And then said, fuck all when Congress decided to pursue that. Again, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. It's in a video that got taken down from YouTube. But if they would have put him up on criminal charges, I think they would have probably got him. I think they would have probably got him. But they did this impeachment bullshittery, um, and it fucked them. It fucked them in the end uh, because because they were running into gray uh, gray territories, which meant that the Democrats didn't have a, a good case because they don't know how to fight these sort of things. They're really, really bad at fighting these sort of things. Uh, and it was going to split the country even further. Uh, Sarah says Joe Biden is a corporate Republican. Same as he always was. He lied to us in the Iraq war and Pelosi, Pelosi covered for it. And she did. Yeah. And she's going to continue covering for him. Kamala Harris will cover for him. AOC will cover for him. Ro Khanna will cover for him. All of these fucking people are going to cover for him because what they are are party loyalists more than they are, uh, you know, representatives of the people. They're party loyalists. And what does the party represent? The party doesn't represent the people. The party's never represented the people. Democratic Party, since its inception, two, three hundred years ago, uh, maybe about maybe closer to 200 years ago, was always a party that was pro business, pro industry. The Republicans originally started as a pro abolition and pro people party. Lincoln was reading Marx. Lincoln was advocating for a major worker reform, changing the structure of the country to be more focused on taking care of its people. Ulysses says Grant was going after the KKK. I mean, these were Republicans that were on our side, right? And then William McKinley shows up and he was like, well, you know, the Democrats are doing a lot better uh, when it comes to getting funding from big business. And I want some of that funding so I can like have a bigger campaign. And so he went out and, and basically was like, what do you guys want? And then gave them whatever he wanted. And that's how William McKinley won. Teddy Roosevelt tried to undo what William McKinley uh, wanted to do. But Teddy Roosevelt was also somebody that had a little bit of a silver spoon in his mouth and was a bit of a libertarian until after his presidency. After his presidency, he saw what the banking industry can do. He saw how corporations are acting and he saw the writing on the wall which is why he uh, uh, started the Bull Moose Party, ran against Grover Cleveland in 1912, got 20% of the vote, defeated Grover Cleveland, but unfortunately we got a racist Democrat into, into office, Woodrow Wilson. The Democrats have never been a party for the people. The Democrats have always been a party for private industries. And the sooner people kind of realize that, the sooner they'll see that all, I mean, they have been at the forefront of neoliberalism since their inception. Their point was to put forward a neoliberal economic policy, a neoliberal government that's run by capitalism, that's run by profit, that's run for the private industry. WM, one, the $1.9 trillion COVID relief that has a lot of good things in it, quote unquote, a lot of good things in it, uh, is the same deal in place when Trump was president and it was $1.8 trillion. It had a quote unquote, a lot of good things in it too. Yeah, it's not any different. That COVID relief bill is not any anything different um, than than what uh, what was already in place when when Trump was still still president. So but you know they'll it, it's all PR spins. It's all it, you, you kind of have to learn how to how to watch these people's rhetoric because their rhetoric has a lot to do with it. Uh, how they speak and what they're talking about has a lot to do with it. Um, so, but again, it, it, it goes to show how there's really no difference between these parties. They're basically putting forward the same idea, but they're presenting as something new, something different, something more progressive because we have a D by our name now. The, the country's president has a D by his name. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook, especially Facebook and YouTube. 
they often uncensor people, uh, un unsubscribe people, and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows, the Forkful of Noodles live virtual comedy shows. Uh, the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website. But if you're also on financial stable ground, you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets and bonus content. And go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to, to make any kind of financial contributions. But if you can't, it's not a necessity. Most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.